Thank you, Sarah. Um, and massive thank you to everybody for taking the time to, to come on today. Um, who thought um, last year, and I've been saying this for a year and what even feels like a year and a half now, that you know we would be so well versed in, in doing online events like this. Um, and many of you probably are well used to this, but you know, a lot of us, um, you know, when we did events in real life, really didn't imagine that we would still be doing so many brilliant events virtually. And I think this is a really good example of one that, you know, we probably wouldn't have had the opportunity to do if it wasn't for brilliant partners. We've got like Al McToon College in Dundee um, and the fact that we've got such a great speaker um, coming to, to kind of talk to our audience um, and giving us the chance to kind of learn about learning and how important it is for our organisations. So I would really just like to do a massive welcome on behalf of the Chamber to, to every one of you that's come on today. Um, we've been having quite a conversation on LinkedIn about this session actually, so if you haven't had the chance yet to, to connect with our speaker or Linda or any of the others at Al McToom and, and kind of get involved in that on LinkedIn, then I would definitely encourage you to do so. But um, today is definitely all about that competitive advantage. We are going to be talking about why and and the importance of making sure that your organisation is absolutely committed to learning. Um, and I'm really looking forward to taking part in this session. And what we'll do is once we've heard from our speaker, then um, Steve Smith, who is um, a long-standing chamber member and vice president, nearly president of the chamber, is going to come on and look after the, the question and answer session uh, and help out at the end. Um, I have to slightly slope off um, just before the very end of the session because we have our first virtual trade mission with Virginia US happening this afternoon um, and we're really looking forward to connecting our members and some other Scottish businesses with the business community in Virginia um, and that comes on the back of a really very successful virtual trade mission we did last year with Dubai um, and taking Scottish companies to Dubai so really looking forward to making the most of our connections outside of Dundee and Angus and this is a really great example of it. So first of all I'm going to hand over to Linda McHugh from Al McToom College who's just going to tell us a little bit um, about why they're involved with our session today. Um, they are a fantastic partner of the Chamber and we're delighted to be working with them. So Linda over to you. Great, thanks Alison and thanks to everyone at the Chamber for having us today. Um, so for those of you who don't know um, we are Al McToom College and we're based on Blackness Road in Dundee. We're a unique place of learning um, and we offer various um, different courses um, and uh, one of our specialist areas is in organisational learning, which we're going to talk to you about today. Um, we are quite a small, unique niche um, place of learning and we have quite small class sizes um, and we have uh, students from a range of different backgrounds, um, all ages um, and um, who all come for, for different reasons. Um, we also offer all of our courses on a, a unit only basis, which might be in, um, of use for anybody who's thinking about upskilling their staff. Um, and we do have funding available for those individual units as well as um, our full time courses. So um, just to give you an, an example of what we do. So we have some Arabic language online courses starting next week. Um, so they're um, for complete beginners. Um, and if you're a, a member of the Chamber of Commerce, um, you do get a discount on that. So anybody who's interested, let us know. We also do um, full-time courses in Arabic language, as well as um, HNCs and Ds in business and management and leadership. Um, and then we have um, a range of um, professional diplomas in moral economy, sustainable development, Islamic finance and entrepreneurship. So um, that kind of gives you an overview of what we do. Um, we are um, in the process of um, putting together a course on organisational learning, so a full-time course. Um, I, I can't share too much with you at the moment, but if you are interested, please um, let us know, um, either email us or I can send you a link to sign up to our mailing list. Um, so yeah, that's um, about a little bit about um, Almetum College. So um, what I'll do now is I'll just pass you over to Dr. Ali Garad, who is a visiting lecturer from Almetum College and also an associate professor at Portsmouth University. He is a specialist in organisational learning and he is going to tell you and hopefully me all about it today. I'm looking forward to, to hearing about it. So um, Al, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Alo, you're on mute. I'll, I'll repeat this again, one <laughs> second. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. 
thank you very much, uh, Alenda, uh, Wells, uh, Wells and, and Steve and everyone from Al Maktoum College and also from uh, the Dundee and Angus Chamber of Commerce. It's a pleasure uh, to be with you today and uh, I hope you will find something interesting from my talk today. I'll do my best to bring some uh, examples and also some uh, relevant content. Uh, I've got a lot of content here, but uh, but this is to be shared with you later on. So don't worry, don't get uh, uh, overwhelmed by this content. Uh, so this is the topic, it's a tester, and these are the topics that we're going to discuss today. I'll keep uh, some time to, to have a discussion and answering your questions, but the whole topic is around uh, or about organizational learning, individual learning, and what are the different uh, methods or mechanisms that individuals organizations and even governments can learn if if at all governments would learn or like to learn uh, i am a visiting lecturer at al maktoum college and also i'm a search professor at uh, uh, portsmouth business school i'm a fellow at the royal society of arts in scotland and it's, it's all over the uk i'm also a consultant and and i i write books and I write articles assessors as well in um several quality awards and this is one important source for my learning because when I assess companies I get to learn from these companies that I assess. Uh, I'm just uh, citing here a couple of uh, slides uh, from the World Economic Forum and this gives us um, an overview about the growing skill set uh, and, and we are talking about just next year. I mean I had this a couple of years ago and was looking into 2022 Oh yeah, that's still coming after a few years, but it's just it's just tomorrow. So th these are the uh, the growing skills that needed, and these are the top ten. And you can read for yourself here how learning is very important uh, skill in, uh, in in the skill set for the future or for tomorrow. Actually, talking about active learning, creativity, you are talking about technology design, programming, critical thinking. We always see the word critical thinking, but not all of us uh, capture this and take action on it and try to see what this so-called critical thinking or, or reflection or critical reflection and how to put this into business and also how to productize this knowledge we have. There are so many things that we can learn quickly that can help us to productize our knowledge, to make it as a product and this product would be sellable. We can gain revenue from it on, on the individual level as well as on the organizational level. I have a friend of mine who developed a course. Uh, it's a 12 hours course. She developed it during COVID. And this is about speaking skills and about uh, presentation skills. You can't imagine in six months, she sold 55,000 course. She sold it 55,000 times on a website called Udemy. There are so many of these platforms, Coursera, Udemy, and, and, and these platforms for learning. Look at this here. Uh, what are the jobs needed in, the, in just here? See, the, the, again, we're talking about artificial intelligence, machine learning. It's, it's not just a fluffy thing now, just things in the air. These are jobs are created and uh, there are opportunities uh, for people here to work in these areas. The good news here, all of this can be learned and can be learned not only in, in the academic context, but can be learned also from practice, can be learned from short courses and professional certification as well. Again, I don't want to shock you, but here is some statistics telling us only 8% of people around the world achieve their goals, only 8%. Can you imagine? 92% of us do not achieve our goals. So how, how to achieve the goal? If we don't learn, if we don't acquire new skills, if we don't know how to solve problems, if we don't know how to productize our knowledge, if we don't know how to brand ourselves, how can we achieve our goal? So we have to be proactively learning. We have to put learning in the to-do list. When we go to shop, we have a list, we say these are the items to shop or to buy. When we wake up in the morning, we have to do list. We really need to include one item called to learn. So to learn something new, to acquire some new knowledge or to improve a skill. So I would like to also highlight here 
that learning isn't compulsory. Nobody will put a gun in our head and say, go and you have to learn. Uh, learning is a choice. We choose to learn. But also survival is a choice. Nobody will stop us from taking out our, si our life or committing suicide. It is a, it's an option, it's, it's a choice. So learning is survival. Uh, my inspiration of this topic started 20 years ago. I, I, I used to be, and I'm still a quality professional. I do audits, I, I write manuals, I, 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 I develop standards with British Standard Institution. And so I was very deeply involved into quality, but I thought there is something missing in quality, which is learning. And I came across this book in 2001 called The Fifth Discipline for Peter Singier. And Peter is considered to be the guru of organizational learning. I couldn't stop myself until I finished this book. And this was, you know, sometimes we hear about a book that changes your life. Uh, th this is one of the books that really changed my life and my career. So I said, I have to learn more about this. I spent five years doing a doctoral thesis in organizational learning, understand how to learn on the individual level and also how organizations learn, unlearn, relearn. Uh, so these are the topics. I, I like network, networking. So I said that writing the, uh, reading the book isn't enough. I have to meet this guy, Peter Singh. So you see how, how young was I here? So I, I met with Peter Singh. I, I started to become an active uh, member in the Society for Organizational Learning where Peter Singh uh, established or founded at MIT and it's still running and active. Then I, 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 I had a bigger dream that to, to organize a conference and to, to bring Peter Singh as a speaker. And this dream took me till 2012 where I established a conference in Dubai called Organizational Learning Conference, Middle East and North Africa. And guess who would be the keynote speaker? So we had Peter as a keynote speaker and uh, it, it was fabulous. It was amazing. It was very emotional because when we talk about learning, it is not just like any other event or conference. It is emotional. We have to feel it. We have to, to taste it and we have to really uh, fully engage and, and live it. So technology can be outdated uh, any assets can be copied even people can be headhunted and organizations can headhunt people from other organizations the only sustainable competitive advantage i don't know if you agree with me or no is learning learning can't be stolen from you unless you are willing to share it with others unless you are willing to make it explicit. So the tacit knowledge, the tacit learning in our brains, we only decide if we want to make it explicit or we just want to keep it tacit. So learning is the sustainable competitive advantage and it is applicable for individuals, it's applicable for societies and also applicable for governments. The um, Secretary of Treasury in New Zealand a few years ago wrote a book, uh, his, his name is Graham Scott, uh, wrote a book called The Learning Government. Uh, and, and this is a hot topic nowadays. Um, uh, it is uh, uh, reinforced and advocated by organizations such as the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, the Learning Government, OECD. So all these organizations are now uh, encouraging governments to learn as individuals learn and as companies learn. Talking about learning, there are three levels here. Individual level, which we know we learn, we may learn something from this presentation. We may learn something from the chat. We learn, we may pick a, a website, a link from someone and we'll go to this website and it, it opens doors to the world uh, with us. Um, Today I was in Tayport Primary School. I was talking to the kids about my book and, and, and about learning. And you can't imagine how many talks I note from the kids at P4, primary four. So I, I have learned a lot from this meeting in the morning. I learned from the teacher as well. So we learn from every, I would say every interaction on our day is a learning opportunity. 
but we need to be conscious. We need to be uh, mindful to capture where is the learning here. And I, I have my cell phone all the time. I take notes. I use a software called Evernote. I, will, I use another software called Symbol Note. Whenever I come across an idea or, or good thing to do, I take a note. The idea of the conference, I took a note of it in the cafeteria of Salford University in 2006. I still ke I kept the note until 2012, six years, but I didn't forget it. I took a note because if you get a brilliant idea, if you don't take action on it within 180 seconds, the idea will die. 180 seconds is your window to take note of the idea or to take action on it. Otherwise, you may lose it forever. So individuals can learn, teams can learn as a group, and I will show you some methods of this learning, and also organizations can learn. And, and we can unlearn, we can forget, and we can delete the learning when it is dated, when it is outdated, when it is irrelevant, and we can relearn new things because our memory can't capture everything. So we have to be selective with what we learn. And I personally believe in actionable learning, that learning, that kind of learning that can benefit me as an individual and can benefit my organization and can benefit my country. It will be great to learn for the sake of learning, but life is short. We don't have lots of resources just to learn for the sake of learning. We need to learn good things, that will make us better, will make us different, will add value to our life. In fact, to add life to our life. In order to learn as an individual, I, I put this together. I can't claim that this part is based on research. This past part is based on my uh, practice, based on my reflection. I put this list first, we have to be humble, humble in a positive way that we acknowledge that there is other things to be learned and there are people doing things better than us and we can learn from them. We can benchmark from them and we can even outperform them. So there is no harm to do this. Then we can share what we learn and then we can update this learning. Uh, learning requires us to take ownership. Uh, your parents can pay for you to go to school or you pay for your kids to go to schools and you can pay a lot, but there is no guarantee that we learn because we have to take the ownership of learning. We adults have to invest in learning. We have really to invest time, energy, and funds as well, because this is a fantastic investment. In 2014, I did a TED talk, a TEDx talk in Dubai. And I said the first salary I got when I went to Dubai in 1994, uh, when I left Dubai and I, I, I finished the job at the time when I was talking in the TED talk, I doubled, I increased my salary 80 times, 80, 80 times from the first salary till the last salary. And that's only because I learned things that I was able to implement it in my workplace and I was able to productize it. So it is nothing magic about it. I am an average uh, person in school. However, I, I managed to uh, use that learning. We have to be brave. We have to challenge our intellectual and don't feel humiliated when we, there is something we don't know. We have to ask, there is no harm to ask. Uh, we have no harm to be trailblazer, to go to take the routes that unwalked un before or nobody walked in this route, be a trailblazer. So that's another thing. Reading is a crucial thing. If you don't like reading, watch videos, watch YouTube, select good things to watch, um, take courses on these platforms. It's for free. Observe. And, and I thought sometimes I think observation is a gift because not everyone learn by observation. So we have to observe. We don't, need, we don't wait till somebody tell us, yeah, you have to extract this lesson. Learning by observation, observation is very powerful. Um, the gems, the, the, the knowledge doesn't come from experience. It comes from reflecting on experience. I might have 20 years of experience, but I did learn nothing. Learning will come from reflecting on experience and extracting the lessons learned. We have to be tolerant. We have to share what we learn. The more we share things, the more we learn. 
The best thing to learn something very well is to teach it. I learned this lesson as a, as a faculty member and really try it. I, I, I bet the if you want really to learn something 100%, try to teach it. You will learn it 100%. The most important is number 10, but I would put it number one, but it is better about it here because it comes after learning. You have to take action. Okay, so learning without action is not useful. We, we sit in conferences every day. We have Zoom fatigue nowadays. We sit at least three, four Zooms every day. We, we like things. We go to this, you know, inspirational speaker and we listen and we enjoy and then we leave. Not everyone takes action on this learning. And this is the gap between what we are here and where we are here and the success and future is taking action. So please, if you forget everything from this presentation, just remember these two words, take action. If you remember this, I'll be happy and I feel I've done something useful today. Um, we wanted to bring together this learning. Uh, Jeff Gold is my mentor and friend of mine. He was my examiner in my PhD and uh, we worked together closely in the past few years. So we wanted to bring this knowledge in, in something tangible because I know you, you people, you like, you love learning. But what, what is learning? Is it training? Is it attending conferences? Is it attending a university? So we wanted to bring this knowledge in a, an understandable model, a framework, a handbook that people can learn. So we brought together our research and we presented in OLKC, the Organizational Learning and Capabil Knowledge Capabilities. It is the, the, the prime international conference in, on organizational learning and the only annual conference. I got two rejections before, but this time was lucky that I got accepted with this conference. We presented our paper in Liverpool Business School in 2018. And after that, we published the model in 2019 after we received feedback uh, from the audience. To give you just an idea about the effort we've put together in this model and trying to uh, have something really solid, we've run over 44 interviews. We, we, we had focus groups and we had more than 800 hours of direct observation. Part of these observations we did in Dubai, part of it done internationally, uh, in Maldives, in Philippines, in Bulgaria. So it is not in, in one sector. We've reviewed over 3000 documents. Uh, if, you, if you get um, to see the, the references in the book, The Learning Driven Business, you can see really how many uh, uh, artifacts uh, we have put together and extracted to make something uh, tangible and readable in just uh, a, a book called The Learning Driven Business. I will talk about it later. So basically to make things simple, uh, in order for learning to happen, we need three elements here. We need the learner and a mindful, active learner who has the um, appetite to learn and has the curiosity to learn. Uh, I remember uh, I read once uh, Einstein said, if I am good at one thing, I am curious. If I'm good at one thing, I am curious. So curiosity in a positive way to, to find facts, curiosity to learn new things. So we, are, we read, if we are not curious, please try to be curious. Okay. Um, so we have learning process as well because learning should be structured, should be really uh, mindful. So what is the process? for this learning and at the end we need to check we need to measure what is the outcome we may attend a conference every year i used to go to a conference i pay and i go in another country and one day after five years I said what i'm learning here the only thing i got is the networking with people so we have to to see if what if if networking is your cheese that what you're looking for then fantastic then keep doing it so the point here, I, I cite again Deming, the godfather of the quality management theory. If you want to keep getting what you are getting, keep doing what you are doing. If you want to keep getting what you are getting, keep doing what you are doing. So if you are not happy with the results you are getting, then you need to change something. You need to change. So we have to measure. What we cannot measure, we cannot improve. 
So when we learn something, we need to measure what is the outcome of this learning. And the outcome of our research, we identified 15 mechanisms, 15 methods that can be used to learn. Some of these methods for us individuals, even if you are not belonging to any company or you don't work, you can, you can still benefit from these mechanisms. There are individual learning, there are mechanisms for groups or teams, and there are mechanisms for organizations on the overall level. So that was confirmed by empirical evidence. We emphasized on the role of, of leadership. If leadership does not support an advocate learning in the company, forget about it, it will not happen. So leadership should support learning. Use of technology, that's, that's amazing, that's magic. Without technology, we would struggle. So we need to find out how can we use uh, technology to uh, enable learning. Uh, we talked about employee engagement and I can literally, I run a three days course only in these two words, employee engagement, how, how it works, how it fails, how to make it really um, embedded into the system. So employee engagement is an amazing, amazing topic and it's a, a hidden gem in any organization. Importantly, to reward learning. If, if you as a, a CEO or you as a manager or a supervisor or a parent, if you are a father or mother, you need to reward learning for your kids, for your employees, for your colleagues, for your friends, uh, because rewarding learning will encourage it. Will, will Remember you, you, when your kids come from the school with a certificate that they have learned something or they got, see the, the positive energy in it. Even we adults, when we get such a certificate, or a letter of thanks, or a, a collage, or a trophy that we achieved something, it, it means a lot. Okay, so rewarding learning is very important. Then proactively encourage team learning. We focus on individual learning, we focus on organization level learning, but most of organizations, they discount, they don't look into team learning. And teams can learn in a very efficient way with several mechanisms. Another thing also is learning from stakeholders. If I'm the DAC or the Chamber, uh, Dundee and Angus Chamber of Commerce, we have, we have our members. The Chamber can learn from members and also can share learning with members. Members can learn from each other. Then we can learn from the regulatory bodies around us. We can learn from our customers. We can learn from our suppliers. I, I was a judge in a competition last week um, it is run from New Zealand, but they had uh, uh, candidates from around the world. One of them was a hospital that organizes an annual conference to the suppliers. So every year they bring suppliers, they are so generous with them, they provide them with everything. And all what they ask them, what's new in the market? What are the equipment? What are the things that can help us to do a better business? And you listen to these suppliers and, and the, the generosity and the information they tell the hospital, you wouldn't imagine. And there is no wonder that this hospital have achieved over 200 awards because they learn. They learn from employees, they learn from suppliers, they learn from patients, they learn from the families of the patients as well. So we have to be open for this. Um, uh, we called our model and organization, we developed a model and we called it, uh, we put the ecosystem, that this is an ecosystem model. I just tried to explain what is ecosystem, what's like biological uh, community uh, and, and our, our, our elements of this system, they interact together. So there is interact, interaction, go to here, just next door, tent smear. I live next to the forest and smear and see all, you know, the trees and the insects and the birds and the animals, they go around. So that's ecosystem, they, they live in harmony. So when we talk about the learning ecosystem, we have to consider all these animals, all these elements in the system and the interaction between them. And ecosystem grows, the, the, the forest grows year after year. Okay, so again, we have to look into the growth element of the ecosystem. Um, so why we need a model? We could read a book and that's it, but we need a model to, to have a, a systematic way of learning, to be able to measure 
what we learn, and also to understand the interaction between the elements. What is the role of myself as an employee if I work for the chamber? So what is my role? How can I help the chamber uh, to do things? And then whom I am inter interacting with? Who are the stakeholders of this? So when we have a model in place, it helps us to understand who is who and what, what are the communication channel, channels and the organizational dialogue here. And then we can capture the learn. I cite this from the World Bank group and they use these mechanisms of organizational learning uh, to solve the big problems like poverty, like development problems, like pandemics. So they, they use learning as a key to solve development challenges and also to meet the uh, goals of the World Bank. And these international organizations are really good since 2001. I am on their mailing list, I, I interact with them, I learn a lot from uh, their literature and they said so generous, they publish all of this for free. So this knowledge is available for free. I also cite uh, Noah Harari, one of the best uh, authors uh, in the past few years, talking about the importance of learning and not only learning, but fast learning. We need to learn fast, we don't have much time. And I don't think this is more relevant ever than the time we live in now, the pandemic and the challenges and the VUCA world we live in at the moment. So um, I cannot really emphasize more on the importance of learning. I quickly show you the, I would say the house of learning or the model that uh, we developed and published. And this model has three systems in it. If you look into the bottom here, we have the organizational learning culture because we have to cultivate the culture at the first place. It has to be healthy culture and understand what is the context of the business. And then in the middle here with the blue color, we have different mechanisms. So we have in the first one to the left, we have an, uh, individual learning mechanisms, then team learning, then organization wide learning then machine learning and this is a very hot topic and it's learnable it is nothing uh, that so difficult or overwhelming about technology we can learn about machine learning at the top here we see the organization learning outcomes as i said what you cannot measure you cannot improve uh, it is tom peters and peter drucker who said this is not my quote but i love it so i always uh, cite it so if you look into these three colors, we have three systems here. The first system on the bottom, the culture, which answer the, answers the question, why? Why should I learn? What, why? Why it is important? The second system, which is the blue part here, the mechanism, it's about how. So I understand, I am happy, I appreciate why should I learn. Now the next stage, how I learn. What are the mechanisms I can use to learn? And then the third system or subsystem called the outcome, which answers the question what? So how, why, and what? Of course, if you have watched the video for Simon Sinek, you would resonate with this golden circle, why, how, and what? So we, we embedded this here into our organizational learning system, how uh, uh, to learn, why to learn, and what is the outcome of this uh, learning. There are more, um, you know, work here, uh, just to give you an idea that it is not uh, just something we thought of and then we wrote a book about it, but there is a lot of work beneath uh, or behind this model. Um, this is the definition. I know it's a bit lengthy, uh, but maybe later on you can read and reflect on it. So we simply define organizational learning as the process of modifying the behavior, <clears throat> the organizational behavior, through use of different processes, practices, methods, and activities. So today, for example, this session organized by uh, the chamber and the college, this is another, it's an activity for organizational learning, for sharing knowledge. So there are so many different methods. And by this, then at the end, we draw the lessons learned, from within and outside the organization to propose a systematically improvement performance 
and transformation because at the end we need to have our goal is to have a learning driven organization a learning driven chamber which i believe it is i've seen the website of the chamber i saw the performance measures and awards it's amazing sometimes we do things but we don't know the title that this is called organization wide learning or this is called individual learning and this system we developed it caters for uh, all stakeholders partners employees regulators society research community senior management customers so everyone will be able to benefit from uh, this system it's like the machine like three cogs together we can't say okay now we know all the mechanisms the 15 mechanisms we know how to implement them but then the culture cog is not working people do not know why they do things people do not know why they are uh, supposed to do this they are not engaged and disengaged employees will not learn disengaged employees will not learn and in the best scenario if they learn they will not share this learning with others they will not be keen to share it and the third cog is about the outcomes and outcomes will drive the mechanisms and will drive the culture again so it is iterative uh, iterative uh, system and again this is another representation i like visuals so this is why i am fan of of visuals here because it helps to uh, reinforce the concepts more uh, these are the, the mechanisms here. If you like to take a screenshot uh, of this, it's a summary of what are the individual learning mechanisms, uh, what are the examples. I'm not saying this is an exclusive list of uh, mechanisms. These are the ones that we researched and we had empirical evidence. Uh, if you like also to, to note classification of types of people when it comes to learning, we call, we, we've bought three levels here, uh, learning insulators, those members in the organization or the, the, the business, they are not interested in learning, they just compliance oriented, they just take the boxes, they will tell you, tell me what to do, I'll do it, and that's it. So the, the insulators, they don't connect learning. Then we have learning incubators, they learn but they like to keep the learning or there is no mechanism or, or method to spread this learning or to share it with others. So that these are the incubators and the positive or the needed ones are the learning connectors where they connect together. They learn and they share learning and they learn again and they are part of the process. So the ultimate goal of any learning and development manager or chief learning officer in any organization is to help making these insulators and incubators convert them into learning connectors uh, these are the mechanisms and i always leave a question mark here because there must be another one or more we have mentoring we have reflection we have coaching but there are more okay so you may know others and please feel free to get in touch and share with me other methods um, I'll give you a short break to reflect just two minutes uh, disconnect from anything just focus on this slide and think of your working style at the moment okay uh, identify three things that you should immediately stop at you with your working style at the moment identify three things you are happy with and you want to continue and then another three things that you are not doing at the moment and you want them you want to implement them for example um, i i started a new practice a few months ago learned from a colleague of mine that he puts a cut off time say after six o'clock p.m i will not answer emails i will not do anything i will physically disconnect from computer emails and then i have life so because with the pandemic, we started to mix our personal life with our business life, etc. So just examples like this. If you can't find three things, then one, one thing is enough. So I'll stop talking and I'll give you the chance to reflect on this. And if, if you like to, to share this with us and put it in the chat box, would be great if you like to share some thoughts.
I will disappear from the camera so you you think what you want to to to, to do. So if you like to share anything, hi Jeff. If you like to share with us what things, um, unless it is really too personal, so you don't need to do. Okay. But if any volunteer will be nice. Otherwise I will proceed uh, with. Uh, uh, I was just, can I just ask something? Hello, I was just beginning to type it and then. Um, yes, there, please. If I can, it'd be quicker if I speak it actually. I think, thank you. That was a really useful sort of um, interlude to, to, to reflect. We've seen pretty much everybody has been working from home, um, but we've got people beginning to come back into the office now. There are still some people who want to continue to work from home full time. So I'm thinking, well, how is that going to affect organizational learning longer term? And when I look at your red, amber, green, I'm thinking I need to focus on that green for keeping engaged or engagement with everybody in a, in a physical sense as well. Okay. Um, I, I take note of this, Adair. If you allow me, I will answer after, uh, after I finish these few slides. Is that okay? Great, thanks. Lovely. Um, okay, so please, uh, the chat is open. I see some people saying stop social media. Uh, Dr. Abdul Hamid here. Nice, continue. Uh, yeah, I see. Uh, not nice, nice to hear. Please keep keep posting it. Keep posting them. We have a record of this. And uh, I have Dr. Amira here. Welcome on board. Okay, let me cover. And, and maybe also, um, Adair, um, some of the next slides will will answer part of the question. Um, I want to share with you this video and uh, I want to make sure also uh, that you can hear this sound. And, and this is an example of reflection because I said reflection is one of the mechanisms that we use in learning to learn on social level as well as on organizational level. What is critical reflection? We reflect all the time. Anytime we think back on something that happened and imagine how we might do it differently next time. Critical reflection is similar, but involves a more formal process. It requires carefully considering how events and experiences have led to personal growth and how we might think or act differently in the future as a result. A critical reflection is not simply a summary of what happened or a report of how you felt during an experience. For a reflection to be critical, you must make connections between what happened, what you learned from that experience, and how you will apply that learning in the future. Your reflection doesn't have to be about a positive or successful experience. We often learn the most when things don't go right. The key is to choose an experience where you learn something important that has changed your beliefs or actions in some way. If you have been asked to relate your experience to specific concepts, make sure you choose an experience that you can relate to those concepts. One model for critical reflection is a three-stage process known as what, so what, now what, developed by Terry Borden. Let's walk through the three stages together. Stage one, what? What happened in a particular situation? Replay the event in your mind as though it were happening in front of you on a movie screen. What do you see? Be as objective as possible. Try not to attach any judgments at this stage. 
Stage two, so what? Analyze the experience more deeply. What was important about the situation for you? How does this experience connect to course concepts? What did you learn? Stage three, now what? This stage is about applying what you've learned. How have you changed or grown because of this experience? How will you think or act differently in future situations because of this experience? What are you going to do next? Remember, whatever you are reflecting about, be sure you provide specific examples, explain the significance of what happened, and relate your experience to course concepts. Finally, be sure to explain what you've learned and how you will apply this learning in future situations. For more advice, examples, and templates for writing reflection papers, visit writeonline.ca. To give you a specific uh, uh, implementation of this, I know uh, a CEO of uh, uh, a small company. He allocates, uh, he, he provides everyone, everyone in the organization, they have 30 minutes every day. And this is on the top of their break, uh, lunch break or whatever. They are entitled to 30 minutes to reflect. So they can just disappear somewhere and, and reflect and come up with the uh, ideas. And they take a stock of all these uh, uh, ideas coming through this reflection and they link it to uh, a steering committee where they uh, filter them and take some ideas forward. And uh, I've seen really good, good examples of how people put reflection into action at the workplace. Uh, so the, the topic can have more time, if maybe in the future we can talk more about it. Uh, team learning, we have quality circles, we have problem solving teams and we, we have action learning sets. Um, Je Professor Jeff Gold with us today, he's the expert and the guru with the learning set sets. We have also after action reviews and I have my question mark here that there are more methods as well. Basically, I picked one of them called after action review. And maybe after the lecture or the webinar, I want you really to try, go to Google and type after action reviews or just type AAR and see the amount of literature practice and publications on these three letters. And basically we can do this without any training. We can start it immediately today. So after this session, I will sit with Linda, with Shireen, with, um, uh, Wilson was 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 the team, and see what went right, what happened, uh, what ha what was supposed to happen, uh, and what actually happened. What are the learning from what happened, and uh, why it happened this way. So there are four questions to ask, and then we can get lessons learned to consider uh, next time when we organize such a practice. I pick another uh, video for you from a, a fire station here. I'm Jamie McKenzie, Senior Instructor for Leadership Development. I'd just like to take a couple of minutes to talk to you about after action reviews or AARs and a little bit about the process that we use. The after action review is simply a professional discussion where we actually look at an event or something we've just been involved with, particularly as soon as we can after the event, that we can then look at it through different eyes, different lenses, and look at things that uh, we can sustain and what we can improve on. The after action review, probably I think from a team perspective, gives you your biggest bang for a buck, particularly about improvement. It's all about, the, the key to an after action review is, it's based around four questions. What was the plan? What actually happened? Why did whatever happened happen? Um, in the interest of time, I will, I will proceed with the rest and um, I will share the links of the videos and, and all these slides with, with, with you. So the third, the third level of learning, we talked about individual learning, we talked about team learning and different mechanisms. The third level is called organization-wide learning and these are different mechanisms here for learning uh, on the organization level and one of them is the suggestion, uh, suggestion scheme and this is an example here, another one about suggestion system and the ideas coming from employees. Avios listens to employee ideas because we think everyone has good ideas and innovation shouldn't be restricted to just one team. 
Uh, the people who work closely with our partners and our customers, they're best placed in spotting opportunities. So it was important for us to, to find a forum or a platform so that they could share those ideas and also get feedback on them. So the objective of the campaign was really to embed innovation across the whole business. And towards the end of last year, we conducted a digital survey which highlighted certain areas where we could do better. Um, and so we wanted to focus people's innovation in those areas for our first idea challenge. So the campaign was called Light the Bulb, and this came from our colleagues over at IAG Digital who experimented with how we could visually show the idea generation. And so they came up with this idea of having these big light bulbs that are linked to the Sideway 6 idea management platform. And so whenever somebody submitted an idea on Yammer, these light bulbs around our offices started flashing and lit up in different colours depending on the uh, idea stream that was submitted. Avios employees put forward their ideas on our Yammer group which we created, it's called Avios Ideas. Um, we chose Yammer because it's a really good place to collaborate, um, it's also a good place for people to socialise their ideas, so every post that was made people could then comment and like and use the expertise to support each other and make every idea as good as it could be. Cyber 6 made it really easy for us to manage the ideas because once you've set up a campaign, it just kind of runs in the background. So everyone was posting to the Yammer group and then Cyber 6 picks up on that and then I could just move them between the buckets that I'd set up in the campaign earlier on. The response to the campaign has been fantastic. It engaged people at all levels to submit ideas and to get feedback on them. And some members of the leadership team also checked into Yammer and liked ideas, which was really encouraging for the people who submitted them. Another idea challenge is in the pipeline for later in the year. I can't tell you too much at this stage, but it may involve pitching disruptive businesses. So as, as you can see, these are things we can use. We know Yammer, it's available. There are so many other similar platforms. I am. I know I am um, taking more time. I'll just finish in, in, in two minutes, maybe. Uh, but I couldn't I couldn't finish or, or mention about ideas without uh, bringing this guy. Does any of you re recognize who's that person? Who's that individual? What is the name of this guy? I bet that no one knows him. Um, th this this is um, Richard Montanese. He used to be a, a janitor in Lay's, uh, the chips, uh, the crisps company, which belongs to PepsiCo. Uh, in the 80s, he was a janitor on four, $4 uh, per day. And there was a, a, a campaign like the one we have watched now uh, to, to bring ideas. And, and Richard Montanez, he's from Mexico and he likes spicy sauce he couldn't find at that time a certain or or, or his flavor or his favorite sauce so he decided to 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 build on the campaign and he went home and he prepared his favorite sauce himself and picked uh, cheetos he got cheetos before it is dusted in cheese he got plain cheetos and he dusted it with his sauce and uh, he even uh, prepared uh, the bags and prepared a, a, a number of uh, Cheetos bags to the, the management and went the following day, presented it to the management. And on the end of the presentation, after they tested his product, he, they sa he said, I don't know how to write, you know, business plans or proposals. So here is my product. Here is my suggestion. Here is my presentation. Taste it. They told him, leave your um, stuff. You are one of us now. Richard Montanese now, he charges $25,000 uh, an hour to speak in a conference. He's a celebrity and he helped PepsiCo to increase the revenue $19 billion. His book uh, called Flaming Hot is coming in, in June. And uh, now Eva Longoria is producing a film about him. Uh, and he, he has become a very inspirational, he's a motivational speaker. He, 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 did his doctorate, so he has a PhD now, and he's one of the speakers that uh, so generous uh, that he's just $25,000, uh, that's his rate for speaking. So this is an example from one little idea, uh, bringing a new source by one of the employees from the company. And this <laughs> tells you the power of ideas. According to stati statistics published by Sideway6, a, a suggestion company in London, four in five employees have ideas to improve their business. The point is 
the management should listen to them and, and see who are these for and encourage them to bring ideas and learn from your employees. It wouldn't cost you anything. It will bring revenue to you. In Amazon, we have the guy who the developer who invented uh, buy with one click and Amazon had um, a, a patent on this for 20 years and that uh, brought around 159 billion dollar to Amazon only because of the patent of one click purchase that was developed by developed by one of their developers. Even Amazon Prime, which we're using every day now because of pandemic, again, it was an idea from one of the employees and this generates generates annually over $20 billion for Amazon from the subscription of the Prime Club or Prime Service. Small body of determined spirits fired by, I will leave it to you to read it. I think I talked a lot, but I'm, I'm impacted and influenced by this thought. And uh, I again remind you that there is no excellence without, uh, without learning and please put learn or to learn in the to-do list. It will make a big difference when it is proactively practiced. The other slides here, I will not cover. These are the verbatim of the, uh, excellent, the, the learning model, the learning driven organization model. So these are the criteria or the specific things. So what to do next? We have the book you can order if you like, and there is a special discount for the uh, members and people in this webinar from the chamber. Um, Sarah will share with you or already shared with you. And also uh, with Al Maktoum, we developed two routes for a certification. One is the academic one that will come soon with the Scottish Qualification Authority. It's a professional diploma in organizational learning accredited by uh, uh, Scottish Qualification Authority. But we have another faster or fast track route which is Certified Organizational Learning Professional. That's a short, it's an executive education course um, uh, accredited by Missouri State University in the United States. Thank you very much. And uh, sorry, I spend a lot of time. Uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or talk to the uh, chamber. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm all here to listen to you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Grad. It was very informative, very enjoyable. Thank you. Uh, we've probably got time for a couple of questions. And one was just a reminder that uh, Adair had asked about how to physically engage with staff who are maybe working remotely these days. Yeah, um, the, the, with physically uh, at the moment, of course, it won't be uh, possible. But I think with the new uh, the the news coming now, since I think starting from Monday, we we can start to engage mm -hmm. uh, with 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 employees, and we slowly back to to work. Uh, but uh, companies, um, I've seen examples of having um, you know social events uh, with the organizations. Uh, even one company in the United States used to have this uh, like a, a a classic music concert live for the employees. So they invited. Uh, a concert and they did a uh, live concert, a live concert uh, for their employees. Um, uh, Botting, you know, something sometimes I bought the, such a picture with tape ports and we start the, the meeting with chatting about where we are now and, and what are we doing. Even with our weekly meeting at the university, we start what are we cooking today and what are we going to have lunch today. So we try to go away from the direct meeting to the minutes of the meeting, uh, the agenda, and starting talking about the the boring stuff, you know, but we have a chat and believe me, over this year, we got to know each other more, uh, more than where we're doing physically, because you have the screen with the names there, but sometimes you sit in a meeting and you don't know who's there, but now we have the names and we chat and we talk and you can see the cats and the kids and the living room. So I think it, we can, there are some positive sides of it, Good. but also... Yeah. Uh, BSI published a guide for this uh, about working in pandemic, and I'm happy to share this with you if this is of any interest. Excellent. Uh, thank you for that. We, we also had an interesting question from Helen Young. It harks back to your earlier slide about 8% of people achieve their goals. How important is goal setting? And is there a, is there a huge percentage of people who don't set goals for themselves? Um, th that's a good question, Helen. There are two things. W one is people, they set goal, but they don't work on it. 
So they get uh, busy with other things and they tend to, they tend to forget the main goal. Uh, that's a part, I don't know exactly what is the percentage of these people. And, and the, other, the other party, those who do not really have a goal or they do not articulate it. They have a gut feeling that they want to do something, uh, but, but they do not articulate it and they don't have an action plan to, to, do the, to, to act on this goal. And they spend 168 hours a week and other things. You know, we have the budget of 168 hours a week, all of us. And it's like, like really currency. Uh, where you spend these hours and what is the percentage of these 168 hours you spend on working towards the goal? Excellent. I hope Thank this you. answer or, or makes sense. Yeah. Perfect. No, it was great. I mean, I, I'm, I'm conscious of everybody's time now, so I think we'll, we'll take that to a close now. However, if anybody's got any further questions, I'm sure if we can put them through to Sarah at the chamber, uh, we can get them to Dr. Garad after that. And his contact details are on the previous page as well. So hopefully you've taken a note there, connect LinkedIn, etc. cetera. Uh, and sorry, sir. No, I wanted to say if, if, so, if some wants to stay back after we, we close, I don't know if, if you are happy with this or you want just to conclude. I think I think we need to close it down because sure. the, the event page is needed for something else. Sure. But we can certainly get in touch. But, uh, but a, a huge thank you, Dr. Grad, for imparting just a a small percentage of your knowledge in this subject. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I uh, really appreciate your time. And another big thank you to the team at Almac Toome College. Uh, they're a great support of the Chamber and the region as a whole. And Linda has popped up a link in the chat to sign up for their newsletter. So any kind of support we can offer around that would be would be wonderful. Uh, thank you to everyone for attending today. Hopefully somebody, hopefully everyone got something out of the, out of, uh, the subject matter today. And as was mentioned earlier on, if this is something that you want to continue looking at, uh, we will be emailing out a discount code for the Learning Driver Business Book uh, that was mentioned earlier on. So it's worthwhile taking advantage of that offer if you can. And finally, a little bit of extra Chamber of Commerce news. We have our forthcoming virtual AGM and business showcase on the 27th of May from 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, we'll be delivering results of a Your Business, Your Future event we had recently, which gathered feedback from businesses on digital innovation, future of the workplace, future skills, and net zero. Uh, it was an, an event I attended myself, and it was, it was very worthwhile doing so, so I'm keen to find out what comes out of that. And members also have the opportunity to showcase their businesses and do a bit of networking virtually as well and all the information on that is on the Chamber of Commerce website. And that's pretty much us. Thank you very much to everybody for your time, uh, for taking part today, and hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure, and apology for eating your time for questions. <laughs> Don't worry. I bought my link then. If you have any question, please. <laughs> we um, would all rather you spoke than I spoke. So. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Thank, Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.